Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our live virtual MDA CMT event. I'm excited that we have wonderful information to share that is devoted to the Charcot Marie Tooth community. My name is Nicole Petrowski, and I'm the Community Education Specialist for the MDA. And we're so glad to have you join us today for this important educational symposium. MDA is committed to community education. We believe in the power of bringing our community together for opportunities to learn from specialists in the community and having opportunities to connect with others. This part of the larger MDA Engage series with disease specific symposia and community education seminars taking place throughout the country. We also have online education opportunities through our MDA Engage community webinar series. Here's a list of our upcoming Engage seminars we will be hosting this year. Be sure to check out the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on Engage seminars, symposiums, and webinars this year. Just like everyone else, MDA is very aware of the pandemic affecting all of us right now. Therefore, we have created a resource page dedicated to COVID-19 resources and recommendations for our neuromuscular community. Please visit mda.org slash COVID-19 for up-to-date information and view important past education events related to COVID-19. Now, I have just a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin our symposium today. We are recording today's event and we will be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing in a few weeks and to ensure that those who weren't able to join us live today are able to access this information. For those of you joining the live event, please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation, so please utilize the Q&A icon to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of webinar icons will appear. Click on the Q&A icon to open the feature and enter your question to host. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation is over before submitting your questions. As you think of them and they come up during the presentation, please feel free to send those in. We encourage participants to communicate with other participants as well by utilizing the chat feature throughout the day. Want to just say hi and let participants know you are attending or want to share a bit of your story with others um, who are also attending or have a question on something outside of the topic that we will be discussing today. You are more than happy to use that and to obtain suggestions from the community. So use that chat feature. What you will do is simply click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and enter your comment to other participants. Feel free, like I said, to use it throughout the day. You will notice on the agenda there are small breaks between the speakers. Feel free to stay connected to the live broadcast during these times, but this will also allow you some time to grab some water or a bite to eat throughout the day. Finally, uh, we will be sending out a brief survey at the end of our symposium today, and we would like to receive your feedback on what you heard. We want to make sure what we are discussing are topics that are of interest to you, and we use your feedback as a way to improve future educational events. So thank you in advance for taking five to 10 minutes to complete that survey post event. And in regards to today's agenda, I am sorry to say that Dr. Govind Arahan from the University of Missouri will not be able to join us today as he has had an unscheduled conflict and he regrets not being able to be here today. I do wanna say a big thank you to everyone in the CMT community who's joining us today. At MDA, community education is important to us and we are happy to be able to offer this opportunity and are incredibly thankful to have you joining us today. Now, I would like to present some information on what MDA is and what it is we do for our neuromuscular community. MDA is committed to transforming the lives of people affected by muscular dystrophy, ALS, and other related neuromuscular diseases. We are able to honor this commitment by our work in two areas, through innovation and care via our 150 plus care center resources, education, and recreational programs, innovation and science with a focus on research, therapies, and technology. And we have been doing this work for over 70 years. MDA is an umbrella organization supporting over 43 diseases in the neuromuscular disease space. 
No other nonprofit supports so many neuromuscular diseases. And as an umbrella organization, we have the benefit of leveraging key learning from one disease to inform others. To learn more about the 43 plus diseases under our NDA umbrella, please visit mda.org under about neuromuscular diseases heading. Now, the MDA has made a significant investment in advancing the treatments for neuromuscular disease through our commitment to innovations in science. NDA is the largest source of funding for neuromuscular disease research outside the federal government. 1.4 billion since our inception. MDA research is directly linked to approved life-changing therapies across multiple neuromuscular diseases. We developed a first and only data hub to aggregate healthcare, genetic and patient reported data and help accelerate future breakthroughs. MDA has been on the forefront of research in neuromuscular disease since our inception 70 years ago. We are at an unprecedented change in the neuromuscular disease space with more treatments and development than ever before and rapid growth in the understanding of the mechanism of neuromuscular disease and its treatment. Currently, MDA has 15 active CMT grants, including grants with a few of our presenters today. And since 1950, MDA's total commitment for CMT research is $39 million. On this slide, you can see the progress that has happened in drug discovery over the past five years in the neuromuscular space. Treatments are now available for periodic paralysis, DMD, SMA, ALS, myasthenia gravis, and LEMS. MDA is proud to have provided funding to many of these treatments along the development process. Now let's take a look at MDA's innovations in care, and we will start with our care center network. MDA has the largest network of care centers for neuromuscular disease, providing best-in-class comprehensive care. Our care centers ensure a multi multidisciplinary approach for patient care, which provides patients the opportunity to see multiple clinicians in one visit, allowing for comprehensive coordinated care and helping to reduce the number of trips required to take to the doctor. Currently, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many of our care centers are doing virtual medical visits. To learn more about what these are and what to expect during a virtual medical visit, please, visit, please visit mda.org and go to our community education section and click on MDA Engage Community Webinars. The URL to the virtual medical visits is also being typed into the chat feature, so please copy that for future reference. The MDA's care network is made up of, like I said, over 150 care centers at medical institutions. We have over 2,000 providers working with families at these care centers. There are over 90,000 annual visits at care centers and over 12,000 individuals are participating in clinical trials. You don't have to navigate your neuromuscular disease journey alone. We are here to help. The MDA Resource Center is available to provide one-on-one -on -one support via phone or email for individuals and families looking for information about the diseases covered under our MDA umbrella. Our Resource Center is staffed by caring professionals, some who are living with neuromuscular disease themselves, and offer a unique perspective and support to the MDA community. The Resource Center provides information on the Care Center Network, disease information, community resources, the Engage Education events, and more as you can see on this screen. MDA's resource staff are available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, and are typically able to answer all questions within one to two business days. Another great tool that is available at your fingertips is MDA's Clinical Trial Finder tool. This tool provides a comprehensive list of currently enrolling clinical trials in the neuromuscular disease space. This tool will walk you through some simple questions to direct you to the appropriate trial that meet the criteria you shared. You can locate this tool at mda.org slash clinical dash trials. MDA also has a myriad of patient and caregiver resources, which are available on mda.org and through contacting the resource center. These resources include Quest Magazine, which is mailed quarterly, multiple print and online resources, including our new Quest community newsletter, and most recently created is our community hub that has disease-specific material, including CMT. 
This URL address is also being typed into the chat feature as well. Be sure to stay connected with MDA's blog strongly as well. MDA is dedicated to advocating for national policies and programs that accelerate the development of therapies and cures, facilitating early diagnosis and treatment from day one, and ensuring access to critical support and promoting independence. Together with MDA's network of advocates, families, volunteers, and partners, we ensure that the collective voice of our community is heard. Some of the current advocacy initiatives include accessible air travel, newborn screening, access to genetic testing, patient-focused drug development meetings, increased federal funding for research, and most recently added the, MD the MDA Advocacy Institute, which is an educational series featuring monthly webinars that provide advocates with grassroots skills, timely news on issues that are important to the neuromuscular community, and updates from Capitol Hill and federal agencies. To learn more about these and additional initiatives, or to sign up to become an MDA grassroots advocate, visit mda.org advocacy. Here are a few of our current offerings to get more involved with MDA. You'll see the URLs are being typed into the chat session, so feel free to jot them down. And as always, you can visit mda.org for details. Our next Advocacy Institute featuring a live discussion with the FDA on clinical trials is this Monday, June 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. The MDA Virtual Camp Program is being offered in six one-week sessions, Monday through Thursday throughout the summer, and is open to children served by the MDA who are between the ages of 8 and 17. And our annual muscle walks are also going virtual this fall, so make sure you register today and continue the tradition of being part of this wonderful community program. Thank you again for all you do for MDA and thank you for attending today's symposium. With this, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Shai. Dr. Shai's translational work has particularly involved models of Charcot-Marie tooth disease type 1B, which is caused by mutations in the myelin protein zero gene. He has been working in this area since the 1990s. The combination of molecular biology, clinical experience, or expertise, sorry, and human genomics offers patients the best chance to have rationally based therapies to improve their quality of life. He serves as the PI of Inherited Neuropathy Consortium of the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, currently in its 11th year of existence. The goals of the consortium are to develop natural history data, develop outcome measures, train new investigators, identify modifier genes, and develop standards of care for CNT. MRI studies are proving to be the most sensitive outcome measures available for detecting progression in CNT. Dr. Shai hopes to continue <clears throat> developing his technology, or this technology rather, as well as develop additional outcomes and identify biomarkers that will enable quality clinical trials for patients with CMT. Hopefully these trials will bring treatments to patients fulfilling the goal of his research career. With that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Shai. Thank you very much, Nicole. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, and will you be advancing the slides for me? I will. Thank you. So if I could have the, so first of all, hello everybody, and thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to me here. Um, these are just my uh, disclosures, and one disclosure I'm particularly proud of is uh, the support we've received over the years from the Muscular Dystrophy Association, so thank you to the MDA. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to start by just sort of going over what we mean when we talk about CMT. So to people in the field, we consider these to be like the genetically based peripheral neuropathies, and these affect the outside of uh, the peripheral nerve, uh, and these are the nerves that have left the back and going down to the hands and feet. And so if you hit the arrow, Nicole, it'll put an arrow towards the myelin, I think. The next slide, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, then the, the second arrow will actually uh, point towards the axon. And the reason these are here is just to show that genetic changes in either the myelin sheath around the axon or nerve fiber, or, and if you hit the next slide, uh, mutations that affect the axon or nerve fiber itself, 
cause CMT. And many of the clinical features are similar uh, in the demyelinating or the axonal forms of CMT, uh, which are what we call length dependent weakness. In other words, worse at the feet and hands, problems with balance, problems with loss of sensation, uh, can be fatigue and pain. So many of these features are common in virtually all of the CMTs, although some cases uh, and some types progress more rapidly than others. And the bottom line on this slide is already out of date because there are way more than 50 known genetic causes of CMT. And if you could hit the next slide. And the next slide again. So if you look throughout all the chromosomes, now there are more than 100 different genes uh, that are known to cause CMT. And for CMT type two, uh, which Dr. Zuckner will talk probably a little bit about in his talk, uh, we still only know a fraction of the total genetic causes. So the next slide. So to try to make sense of all these different genes, we categorize them into autosomal dominant conditions, which means that you just need one a mutation in one of your two copies of a gene to get the disease, or X-linked forms, which mean that it gets, the disease gets passed along with the X chromosome, or autosomal recessive conditions where you need to have mutations in both copies of uh, the causal gene to get the disease. And then the, uh, the CMT type 1, 2, X, or 4 are given a letter depending on the specific gene. So the next slide, please. Then to try to develop rational treatments for diseases, you need to actually know the biology. And all of these different genes play roles in myelin or in the nerve fiber or the axon itself. And so since you know the cause, which is a genetic mutation in one of these genes, this enables you to try to develop rational treatments, which are which is a reason that many people like myself are very excited about doing work in CMT because we can really try to develop treatments which are based on the known cause of the disease. The next slide. So what I'm going to do next is just go through just a little bit about some of the uh, different forms of CMT to try to show, give a brief overview of where we are with treatment and uh, why uh, we think that treatment strategies here make sense. So the most common form of CMT is called CMT type 1A. And this is a form that affects about half of all people who have CMT. So the overall prevalence of CMT is one in 2,500. So about one in 5,000 people uh, in the United States and around the world was, uh, will have CMT 1A. And this is caused by a duplication on one of the chromosomes, chromosome 17, so that there's an extra copy of the PMP22 gene. Ordinarily, you're supposed to have two. With CMT1A, you get three. And interestingly, the same area that has this duplication can get deleted in other patients, and so they only have one copy, and that's what's called HNPP. So the next slide. So this is just a classic presentation of somebody with CMT1A, and there can be variability, but this is true for most people with this that early on their developmental milestones are normal, but they find themselves to be clumsy often as uh, children, they'll be slow runners, have problems with balance. They might be able to ride a bike, but they have difficulty skating, have difficulty with shoes to fit. Next slide. Next slide, Nicole. And everybody on this call's favorite test, I'm sure, is the EMG. Uh, and, uh, I know it's an uncomfortable test, but it's helpful for uh, investigators when they're looking at patients with uh, CMT because it tells whether the problem starts with the myelin or with the axon or nerve fiber. And with CMT1A, the nerve conduction velocities are slow and they're usually about 20 meters per second. They should be at least twice that. Next slide. So what does that mean with treatment? Well, the treatment is it has to deal with the fact that you're making too much of this protein, uh, PMP22. So strategies have really evolved uh, to be able to use what are called antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, to decrease the amount of PMP22 that's made. ASOs are little pieces of uh, 
DNA-like material, which are genetically engineered, which can be introduced into cells, and they can down, or they can turn down the levels of particular genes. And this strategy has been used very successfully in other neuromuscular disorders, for example, in spinal muscular atrophy. Um, similarly, there's uh, techniques called RNA interference, which do a similar technique. So these are rational treatments, and at least with the ASOs, uh, there's published data in the animal models of CMT1A that this uh, treatment can reverse the animal model. And so there's active work going on to generate ASOs that are fit for humans. And uh, uh, so these treatments are on the near horizon. Next slide. Now I'm gonna just talk about some other types of CMT, but again, just very briefly here. So the most common form of axonal CMT or CMT2 was discovered by the next speaker uh, in this symposium, and that's Stefan Zutner. And Stefan identified mutations in a gene and protein called mitofusin 2 uh, as the cause of CMT2A. This affects about 20% of people with CMT type 2. Next slide. So if you look on this picture, you see in the middle two cells near each other. I don't know if you can see my arrow. And these uh, two uh, uh, cells are mitochondria. And for them to provide energy to the nerve axon, they have to fuse together, which is called fusion. And they do this in part with help from mitofusin 2. Mutations in MFN2 prevent this fusion from occurring. And yes, you can go ahead to that next slide. And this is just a cartoon of the MFN2 gene showing all these different mutations in MFN2 that cause CMT2A. So here it's not a question of gene dosage, it's a question of how to uh, get the function of MFN2 to improve. Next slide. And then the last group of, of patients I wanna briefly talk about are those who have what's called autosomal recessive CMT or CMT type four. And these are conditions which can be quite severe and where you need to have a mutation in each of your two copies of uh, the gene to get the disease. So these would be things like CMT4A, CMT4B, CMT4C. And treatments for this have to uh, deal with replacing the gene because for, or the protein, because autosomal recessive forms of CMT uh, need to get the missing protein replaced. And these are called loss of function conditions. So next slide. So what does this mean in terms of treatment strategies? Well, gene replacement with AAV, such as has occurred with, again, with diseases like SMA, uh, for example, are actively uh, being researched in animal models in CMT. And this includes work by uh, uh, Dr. Cleopa from Cyprus, who also uh, receives support from uh, the CMTA, just an example of how worldwide the uh, support from uh, the MDA uh, extends. Um, but also CMT type 2A uh, has uh, generated interest and there is a, uh, uh, a gene therapy company who is actively developing gene therapy tools for CMT 2A uh, as well. So, this leads to the question that uh, I frequently ask uh, in patient meetings is, how can investigators tell if the therapy works? And the quick answer is, well, if the disease goes away, you know that the, it works. But for reasons I wanna discuss on this slide, it's not quite so easy uh, in chronic disorders like CMT. So this is just a cartoon here showing uh, uh, these are nerve cells or uh, neurons and they're axon. And when we do nerve conduction tests, you get a wave, which is called the CAP, and the height of this wave depends upon the number of functioning axons. And if you looked at a nerve biopsy, you'd see in a normal situation, all of these oreo-like structures are myelinated nerve fibers. So here's the axon and this is the myelin around it. And as these axons begin to drop off, the size of this nerve conduction wave begins to shrink. And the number of these myelinated axons 
begins to diminish. And this process continues over time. The waves get smaller. There's fewer uh, axons. And finally, you, not, you can't find any wave or any myelinated axons. And so when we're talking about trying to treat a process like this, first of all, it's important to try to treat early before you get to these later stages in nerves. And secondly, even if the treatment's successful, it may not reverse things uh, immediately and you, may have, and you may be looking at ways to try to slow progression. And so that's what we have to figure out in performing clinical trials or getting ready to perform clinical trials in patients with CMT to see if any of these therapeutic approaches work. And these, again, because it's a slowly progressive disease, at least in many forms, we need to get large numbers of patients. And this is what's led to the generation of the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium, uh, which Nicole mentioned at the beginning. And this is an international group of sites uh, doing uh, research on natural history data, gene identification, and outcome assessments. And again, we're, so proud, we're proud of our support from the MDA, not only from the beginning of these, this, 11, this uh, uh, program, which is now in its uh, 11th year, but even before that, because the only reason we were able to create this was because of support from the MDA in our earlier studies. And currently we follow over 11,000 participants uh, in studies and uh, over 6,000 patients in our clinic. Next slide. And what we do with the INC is we really focus on developing ways to measure progression so that we can use to see uh, if things uh, improve uh, with treatment. And this consists of what are called composite scales, which I'll show you, and uh, which a doctor can do quickly in an exam just based on a routine neurological exam and asking some questions about function in daily life. Then there are functional scales, which we'll talk about. And then importantly, it's a lesson that uh, surprisingly it took so long for doctors like me to learn, but that we need patient reported outcome measures. So I'm just going to go through some of these tools that we now use. So the composite score is based on what's called the CMT neuropathy score, which was developed in collaboration with Mary Riley, Rich Lewis, uh, and David E. Parison, uh, along with myself. And this is an international group because Mary is the head of neurology at uh, Queen Square in London, and David uh, runs the research unit uh, in Milan, Italy. Next slide. And this is just briefly what the score is. In yellow on the top are questions about the function that you have in daily life. Like, do you trip and fall down? Do you need to wear braces? Do you need more than braces to walk? Can you use your hands with buttons or zippers? Uh, can you use a keyboard? Does it affect your proximal arms? Uh, the next items in green are items that you see on, a, we do on a neurological exam. We measure your ability to feel pin for small sensory fibers. Vibration is a measure for the nerves that uh, tell your brain where you are in space, so affect balance. And then your strength in your legs and arms. And then in some, but not all cases, we do data from nerve conduction velocities. And for each of these items, if there's no problems, you get a zero. If there's a maximum problem, you get a four. And so since there's nine items, uh, nine times four is 36. So the worst score possible is a 36. Next slide. And as we did this over the years and tried to look at patients over time, we saw that uh, uh, in many cases, our score was not sensitive enough to detect changes from uh, patients who had more than mild or less than severe disability. So with help from uh, a young investigator, Dr. Sajadi, uh, we uh, developed uh, a, uh, a, we use RAT, what's called rash analysis to make the score more linear and next slide, we now have a, uh, a rash version of this. And because people don't like nerve conduction tests, we looked at the study with and without nerve conductions and found that it was equally sensitive uh, in picking up change over time without the EMGs. So now we use just the first seven items, and this is called the weighted or the rash uh, modified CMT exam score. Next slide. And we then used this in the INC over a number of years with large numbers of patients to just see if we could measure progression of CMT1A with this tool to be able to use in clinical trials. Next slide. 
And this is just the data. Uh, and I'm just focus on the top two scores here, and particularly on this uh, rash, that's what this stands for, uh, uh, row across here. So we were able, with, because of our consortium, we we're able to start with 1,100 patients with CMT1A from around the world. And then over time, the numbers drop off a little bit, but you, think, you see still at year one, there's almost 400 of these patients, over 300 at year two, over 240 at year three, at year three et cetera. And the score, the higher the score, the more problems somebody has. And so you can see in the natural history, the score gradually uh, climbs up. And actually we can detect significant change within a two year period in which we'd be able to use uh, this instrument in clinical trials. Although to do this, we probably need a couple hundred patients in each arm of the clinical trial. So this is the easiest instrument for us to measure. But it also requires patients to be able to cooperate. And if you think back to that slide I showed you with the nerve axons and the waves and the biopsies, you can see that we want to try to treat as early as possible. So we also needed to develop a pediatric instrument. And we also wanted to make an instrument more functional. So with the help of Dr. Burns and our consortium from Sydney and Rick Finkel, who was, was uh, uh, at Nemours at the time and who's now at St. Jude's, uh, we developed what's called the CMT pediatric scale. And this just shows you that it involves functions with the hands, uh, it involves uh, measuring strength with a dynamometer, and it, it also has physical activities like being able to balance on a, a line here, to uh, lunge forward, to do six minute walks. And the next slide. And Dr. Burns, to get normal values for people of all ages, including children, evaluated a thousand people uh, in uh, uh, Australia to get normative values for each of the components of the uh, CMT pediatric scale. And the next slide. And we were able to validate that through our consortium. The next slide. And Dr. Burns developed a tool, an online tool. So when you fill out all the things that a, a child can do and the various items in the CMT beat score, you just click this icon at the end and it normalizes that value toward the age and sex of the child, because what a five-year-old can do isn't what a 15-year-old can do normally. So again, we had to be able to standardize that. Next slide. We then looked at this through hundreds of patients, hundreds of children that we'd seen in our, in our uh, inherited neuropathy consortium. And next slide. And as with the CMT neuropathy score, we found that we are able to detect significant differences within a two year period for, with children who need to use assistive devices, children who had orthopedic surgery, or even children who had no uh, intervention. And again, we can detect 12 to 14% changes from baseline, which is enough to power uh, clinical trials. Next slide. With the help of Kate Eichinger and uh, David Herman uh, from Rochester, we're more recently able to take that pediatric scale and develop a functional scale for adults using many of the same instruments. And this is called the CMT functional outcome measure, which we are now doing in our uh, uh, CMT clinics. So again, we will have functional uh, instruments for both uh, adults and children in CMT to go along with our composite. And then finally, I don't know if I can get this to move, but uh, maybe on the next slide I'll be able to. But because we want to eventually get treatments as early in life as possible, we've developed a CMT infant scale with help from uh, Dr. San Manichi, who is in Thailand. Again, this is a, a worldwide uh, uh, network. Uh, Dr. Mandarakis from uh, Sydney and uh, the rest of us in the INC. And the next slide. And I think you can see some of the things that uh, we use for the infant scale here. These, this scale is for children zero up to four, and we know what they're supposed to do normally because of the thousand norms, and uh, we see uh, how they're doing compared to age. And again, this is done throughout the pediatric site. And this is for gross motor function, and then we also have components for fine motor function. And all of these are 
scored again and uh, used and this, this scoring can, trans can transition into the pediatric scale that I showed you before. So the next slide. So we now have disability outcome instruments that we can use in clinical trials for infants, children, and adults. And uh, this allows us to be able to look at changes over time throughout the lifespan of people. Next slide. And you can just go to the next slide. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned up to this point is uh, having patient reported uh, input and having instruments which give feedback from people who have CMT as to how they think they're doing uh, over time and with clinical trials. So with the help of Nick Johnson and uh, 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 particularly uh, Chad Heatwall, who has a lot of experience in this, we reached out to patients, had patient interviews, uh, took uh, results from those patients, created an, ins an initial patient reported instrument on disease burden, then uh, sent that out to a wider population through a patient contact registry, uh, revised it, uh, did uh, interviews again with patients and made a final document. And now we have what's called the CMT Health Index, which is a patient reported uh, outcome instrument that we can uh, administer remotely. In other words, to people even at home and have them uh, complete this that we can look at over time. And uh, I would just add that with the help of Dr. Sindhu Ramchandran, uh, we've developed a pediatric version of this, which is just being submitted for publication within the next week. So again, those are some of the outcome measures that we use to determine whether treatments are effective. But we also wanna look to see if we can identify biological markers that can not only uh, show uh, if there's disease activity, but that if their treatments are successful, we would expect that these biomarkers to improve. And this is independent of clinical evaluations. And so what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides is our approaches with that. So the first thing is for CMT1A, the most common form of CMT, to see if treatments like antisense oligonucleotides really work, you have to be able to see if you're reducing these PMP22 levels. So with the help of John Severin and others, we uh, took skin biopsies from patients. And uh, if in skin biopsies, there's lots of different cells, but one set of cells are Schwann cells because there are myelinated nerve fibers that uh, 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 ensheath uh, uh, hair follicles and also uh, nerve terminals that have, have to do with uh, being able to feel changes in pressure. So we uh, took skin biopsies, next slide, and we used a little, uh, a technique called nanostring, which is a commercial approach, but what uh, our colleague John Severin did was he got a list of 50 different genes that are expressed by myelin and Schwann cells, and he made <coughs> DNA constructs that express those uh, 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 genes, and then he put essentially a colored barcode on his constructs, a different color for each, or different set of colors for each uh, uh, of those molecules. And using this, you can actually look at the cells like from the, in the skin biopsy, and you can identify which genes are being expressed by just single molecules. And with this, the next slide, we've been able to use what's called a uh, volcano plot. And I don't wanna get in too much detail here, but these are what are called log values. So when you're up here, this is significant levels of PMP22 expression uh, at a significance of 10 to, to the minus eight. So it's just a very precise way that we can now measure the amount of PMP22 in myelinated nerve fibers and in animal models using a skin biopsy, we've seen the successful treatment with ASOs in addition to improving the animals decreases these levels. So we're very excited about having this for clinical trials. And then in blood, we have what's called neurofilament, which are proteins in nerve axons over here that get released into the blood when nerves degenerate. And we can measure 
the amount of neurofilament and show that it's elevated in people with all kinds of CMT. And uh, in, again, in animal models, we've shown that with successful treatment, these uh, become normal. Next slide. And this, you can go on to the next slide. And then just recently also uh, that we've identified using uh, a blood, a brand new protein uh, that's elevated in CMT1A, the most common form of CMT. And this is called transmembrane protein, uh, protease serine 5, a long name. But TMPRSS5 is elevated, and it seems just in CMT1A, not in other types of CMT. And again, we can measure this in uh, blood as a biomarker. Next, and this is just to show that this protein is expressed only in, uh, or mainly in the Schwann cells in the peripheral nerve, and that this is using a technique called CRISPR to, not, to reduce the expression of a gene called SOX10, which is necessary to regulate myelination. And when you do that, you also reduce the level of TM. PRSS5. And this is a little bit heavy science, but the idea is just to show that this TMP RSS5 that we found is regulated in uh, myelinating cells uh, in the process of myelination. So the last biomarker I want to talk about is one that we also have had success with, and this is in a collaboration with Iowa and with London. And this work is supported by the MDA and we really appreciate it. And in this, we're able to look at uh, the leg with uh, MRIs. And what we do is we measure what's called the intramuscular fat accumulation. So ordinarily there's not fat in muscles. There's just fat around our waist, which I, I for one am trying to uh, get rid of. But when fat, when muscles get damaged, uh, either by muscle disease or by nerve damage going to the muscle, that amount increases. And we've been able to measure this and show significant change within just a year. And I'll show you briefly some of this. So here is here are three patients, a 35-year-old, a 43-year-old, and a 64-year-old. This is a calf muscle. This is the, uh, the tibia. And if you hear, see here, it's mostly black. That's what it's supposed to look like for muscle with this technique. But there's a little bit of white, and that's the intramuscular fat fraction. And with the 43-year-old whose CMT neuropathy score is higher, he's more severe, you see there's more fat. And at the 64-year-old, you see all of this here. And what we can do is we can color code each of the individual muscles in the calf. So here is the muscle called the anterior tibialis on the top of your calf, uh, uh, for example. And here is the gastrocnemius, which is on the back of your calf. And we see how much fat is in each of these muscles, and we put a percentage in here. So for this one, the tibialis anterior is about 4%. For the 43-year-old, it's about 34%. And for the 64-year-old here, it's about 64%. So more fat means more uh, fat in the muscle. And this is a busy slide, but I'm gonna go through it quickly. These down here are just the individual muscles in the patients, and this is about 10 patients. And this is the fat fraction. And in three of these patients, the green ones, there's hardly any fat in any of them. That's the mild one. That 64-year-old, almost all the muscles have a lot of fat. But for the other patients, the other eight patients in this study, some have no fat, others have more. And the, the studies we did in Iowa were similar to those in London. And if you go to the next slide, When we look at that fat and we correlate it with our clinical outcomes, we see that the more fat uh, there is, the more, uh, uh, the, the, the more severe the clinical outcome assessments. Next slide. And what we can do is we can look at the amount of fat in muscle over a period of time. And so here's this 43-year-old at a baseline, and here is this 43-year-old one year later. And here are the fat fractions with, with the individual muscles. Uh, correlated. And just to give you an example, at baseline, this anterior tibialis had 34%, like we saw before, after a year, it's up to 36%. And we put all this together, we see, we can calculate the mean change. I need you to go back again, sorry. Back to that last slide. And you see that it's increased, and there's something called an SRM, which is a standard response mean. And this is just a way to tell how many patients you'd need to do a clinical trial using this as an outcome measure. 
And with a standard response mean of uh, over one, you'd probably need only like 50 patients in a clinical trial. And the next slide. What we then did was we got rid of the mildest patients where a lot of the data lumped together. And each of these dots, by the way, is an individual muscle and an individual patient. And the baseline, which is this, which is how they were at zero, uh, is uh, compared with how they did after a year, which is this y-axis. So you see most of the dots are above zero uh, after a year. And we put all of this together, and I don't mean to go too fast, but we see that that standard response mean goes up to 2.44, which means we could run clinical trials with about 20 patients in each arm of a, a CMT1A trial and get significant results with the, uh, with the uh, uh, MRIs as an outcome measure. So again, this is just something which shows a uh, excellent sensitivity and it sort of ends the data I wanna show you. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. But the points I wanna make with this is that, again, with help from uh, the MDA and with all the science that's been going on, we now have clinical outcome measures, we have uh, biomarkers, both in blood and from skin and from MRIs, that we really can run sophisticated clinical trials. So all of us in the field, uh, are really excited about the possibility of having real uh, uh, treatment options that we think have a high chance of working, and we have the technology in place to really uh, perform these trials at a high level. And none of this would happen without the uh, MDA, and uh, these are just uh, a list of many of the people who work with us on the studies. But uh, again, from the beginning of all of this, uh, the MDA has been a part of it, and I really thank them uh, for it, and I thank you for being part of it. Thank you, Dr. Shai, for that presentation. I want to turn now to all of our attendees, and if you have questions, to go ahead and please type those questions using in the chat feature located in the bottom of your screen. I do see we have a couple, so if it's okay, Dr. Shai, I'm just going to read a few here. Of course. Is there any CMT identified in chromosome five? Oh, so you got me. I have to go back and look myself. <laughs> 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 we can go back to that slide. If you want to turn back, I can see what's up there. Let me see here. It's one of the first slides. Hold that on. one where, me, way towards the beginning. Let me go this way. Yeah, and go up towards the beginning. Okay, let's go down a little bit more. Keep going. Keep, keep going. No, I think I missed it. Go up top, I apologize. You're fine. It's the one where we had 90 total. Yeah, that one, this one. This one? Yep. But we want to go back one because it's, that's the advanced version of it. I want to get rid of that white. Right. Okay. Let's see if it'll- Let it'll, me do this. Okay, so yes, there are recessive forms on uh, chromosome four, but I can't remember which gene that is. So one of the recessive chromosome uh, uh, CMTs, uh, uh, at least at this time, is, has been localized to, uh, uh, to chromosome five. Okay, how can I get myself into the possibility of being considered for a clinical trial? So the clinical trials will be performed for the specific subtype of CMT, right? In other words, that if you have CMT1B, you're not eligible for a CMT trial for CMT1A. So you need to know which genetic type you have. And then uh, with help from groups like the uh, uh, MDA, uh, we'll be reaching out to people who, would, uh, who have that, that subtype of CMT. So I think just paying attention to uh, uh, um, you know, the websites of the MDA and similar organizations. And if you're seen in one of the CMT clinics, uh, uh, they probably have information about you already. To answer the question in a slightly different way, these trials will not be restricted to just people who have been coming to INC sites, for example. Okay. 
If you have a skin biopsy, will it affect the area that it is taken from? Uh, no, and I can show you uh, my finger. I don't, you probably can't see it here. But uh, anyway, I've had about 20 on that finger and about 20 on the forearm. So it uh, is done without a, uh, there's no stitches or anything. It's like going to the dermatologist and you get a little a white dot over time uh, as the reminder that you had the skin biopsy. Okay. Um. There's no neurological deficit from having the skin biopsy. Okay. What about, we have another question. I have been using testosterone. I've noticed it has helped my CMT for recovery when working out and walking further. How do we get a clinical trial for CMT people with using testosterone so more people get this benefit? If you look at, if you look at, if you are low testosterone, it is all things that are related with CMT. Do you have so a comment about that? These kind of questions are difficult to, uh, to answer precisely because we like to have you know, evidence for uh, uh, particular medications that is not just uh, from one or, or, or two people. And what I can say is that uh, we've looked through the entire uh, literature uh, of medications uh, uh, to see if any of them have positive or negative effects on CMT. And testosterone has not come up as uh, a compound that has uh, uh, positive effects. And moreover, I think that uh, 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 there can be you know, other complications or issues with that. So uh, I'm being long-winded, but there's no, there's no data out there that supports the use of testosterone. Okay. How do you know what type of CMT you are? So this requires a little bit of evaluation. And uh, the when you see a doctor uh, or a caregiver, if they do a nerve conduction velocity, that can show abnormalities uh, like slow conduction velocities or reduced waves like we talked about. If uh, you go in and so that will say, for example, if you have CMT type one or CMT type two, but then to find out the precise type requires genetic testing. And it's important to have this done uh, with people who have familiarity with it because there are ways to perform genetic testing uh, that can keep costs reasonable. In fact, in a much better way than it was 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But there are also uh, issues making sure that uh, the results are interpreted correctly. So uh, again, I think that's an important component of this. But to just summarize quickly, you need to be seen and you can know the subtype, you need to have genetic testing or have a family member uh, who has uh, a known genetic type and your clinical uh, evaluation uh, fits that. Okay. Here's actually a very pertinent question. How would COVID-19 affect a person with CMT? So that's really a very pertinent question. And we've uh, started to address this, but we've, we sent out a, a survey through our patient contact registry. And this is a registry of about 4,000 people who've had CMT. Uh, around the world. And we've asked those who were affected uh, with COVID to tell, to let us know that, and also to uh, tell us through a series of questions how sick they were with it. And I think the good news is that we sent this out to 5,000 people, and uh, we only identified five who were infected with uh, COVID. Okay. Um, so I think the chance of being affected because you have CMT or being, uh, let's say, put it this way, being worse because you have CMT in general it is not high. Okay. Our concern is for people who have breathing difficulties in particular. And I don't mean just mild ones, but significant breathing, which can be uh, a component of some of the more severe forms of CMT. Then I think there's a little bit more concern. And we see people who have CMT who also have other risk factors like uh, I think diabetes or asthma, and there those risk factors also play a role. Okay. 
here's a question. What happens if you get genetic testing, but it doesn't tell you what type of CMT? So it, first of all, it depends what the genetic testing is, because there are different platforms, uh, some of which look at more uh, genes than others. Uh, and uh, uh, for, in people who have CMT type one, we can find a genetic diagnosis with commercial uh, testing in probably 95% of the patients. But for those who have CMT type two, we can only identify a known cause in about 50% at most, maybe even less than that, which is one of the reasons in the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium, we are uh, looking to identify new causes of CMT. Okay. Which by the way, just to, uh, Dr. Zutner is gonna be on next, but we've just recently identified uh, a very common recessive form, which actually may have treatment possibilities. So it's worth uh, uh, pr pr pursuing uh, the genetic testing beyond just the commercial labs. And then just to finish the question, so if you don't have genetic testing and it's been a lab that uh, looked at, for example, 50 different genes, then uh, I think that's one of the reasons we do research testing uh, through our uh, INC. And they can reach out to me if they have questions about that. Okay. If someone had genetic testing about 20 years ago, could the diagnosis be different now due to changes in technology? By a mile. Okay. So in 2000, uh, in, uh, in the year 2000, there were about three known uh, causes of CMT. Uh, CMT1A, CMT1B, uh, and CMTX, and that was about it. Dr. Zutner identified CMT2A in 2004 to make four. But since then, there's been a revolution in genetics that uh, Stefan will probably talk about. But with uh, next generation sequencing now, we have over 100 genes. So the chances are significantly higher. And it's definitely worth getting looked at again. That's great news. All right, it's almost at the top of the hour. I'll just, we'll take a couple more questions here. This one is asking, how active was the 43-year-old who had muscle fat increase of 2% in just one year. I always hope striving to be more active would be helpful in the slowing of my CMT1A. Yes, so that person was, was pretty active. And uh, as a general rule, we really encourage uh, exercise, but low impact exercise to be easy on the ankles and the knees. So things like, you know, uh, you know, riding a bike, uh, even if it's stationary, is better than a treadmill where there's pounding on the, on the joints, for example. Um, and uh, 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 again, it's, it's really important to be, uh, uh, to be active. Okay. This is actually a very interesting question. I have CMT1A and my genetic testing showed others as well. Is it possible to have more than one form of muscular dystrophy? Okay. So again, we're gonna, this is a peripheral neuropathy, so it's, it's a nerve damage. It's not, muscle, it's not muscular dystrophy. Okay. But uh, it's a, an increasing issue with uh, improvement of next generation sequencing that in addition to finding the gene that causes the neuropathy, there's other variants that show up. And many genes that cause CMT have variants in them, genetic changes that are just benign polymorphisms that don't cause disease. So it's really important to try to sort out those other potential causes because the chances are that they're not contributing to the disease. Okay. A small number of people can have more than one type of CMT, but it really is a very small number. And this is why things like genetic counseling is really important. Okay, and our last question, mm -hmm. being as though we are at the top of the hour, is there genetic testing for CMT that can be done during pregnancy to identify an, if an infant will have CMT? Yes, there are ways to see uh, uh, if that can be done. But uh, things like amniocentesis, for example. Okay, all right. Well, thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. We definitely were able to answer quite a few of those. And also with our next presenter, Dr. Zuckner, he also might be able to answer some of those questions as well. I wanna thank you, Dr. Shai, very much for your presentation and for your time this morning on your Saturday. It's an honor to do this for the CMTA and also for people with CMT. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shai. Pardon me. <laughs> oh, you're fine. <laughs> Have a good rest of your day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. And with that, um, please stay tuned. Our next presentation will begin at 10.10.
Central Time with Dr. Zuckner. And so we will see you then. Thank you.